All right, everyone, let's talk about sugar. When we talk about sugar, usually we are thinking of sucrose, which is a disaccharide that is almost entirely chemically pure and what you get when you squish sugar cane or sugar beets and then crystallize the juice that you find inside. Um, there are a few other very important sugars that we will run into. One of them is glucose. Another is fructose. You might find fructose, you might think first of fructose in the concept, uh, in the context of corn syrup, but in fact, fructose is all over the place. It's in strawberries, it's in apples, it's in peppers, it's where, uh, in lots of places. You'll notice that there is a common nomenclature to sugars. They end in the word os, or the phrase os. That lets you know that if you happen to be walking down the street and you bump into something that says, oh, I don't know, maltose, you can be pretty sure that's a sugar, even if you haven't run into it before. Sugars are generally six or five sided rings, as you can see, looking at the glucose or the fructose, and they're made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If you look carefully at these rings, you'll see oxygen is part of the ring and also occurs in a number of spots outside of the ring. And this earns them the name carbohydrate, which you've heard before. Things like glucose, fructose, and sucrose tend to be referred to as simple carbohydrates, even though I know when you look at them right now, they can be a little intimidating. These form the building blocks out of which more complex carbohydrates are made. By and large, in terms of food, sugars are coming much more from plant sources than from animal sources. Something I should mention uh, here, and I'll mention it again, is I'm gonna start including the yellow star of most of the time. That is, we're going to simplify a few things because a lot of what we're talking about is something you could get an entire PhD dissertation looking into further. So when I say sugar is mostly coming from plants, yes, there are a few exceptions out there, but really from a uh, food science perspective, we can do pretty well by focusing on plants as our main source of sugar. So get used to thinking that there are exceptions to almost every rule I'm going to pose, but the rules that I will pose will keep us in the right space upwards of 80% of the time. Now, why do plants have sugar? Plants have sugar, and you go back to your uh, bio class that you took in high school, uh, as both a energy storage mechanism and also as building blocks. So in more uh, technical terms, it's something for both metabolism and, and anabolism something that you can use to make things out of. We'll talk about what plants make out of their sugars in a second, but we know that plants trap the energy, um, or plants more specifically, use the energy of the sun to form the chemical bonds that are sugar, and then when digested by either us or a plant or something else, uh, that energy can be used to, uh, to do other things. And we can see that if you go take a marshmallow, here's a marshmallow, and you go set it on fire, you will notice energy is released in the form of heat. And while the rate at which uh, a marshmallow on fire releases energy is much, much faster than the rate at which you release energy when you eat a marshmallow, the fundamental reactions are much the same. And I'm sure we will talk about those in the future. So where do we find sugar? Well, sucrose, the vast majority of the world's sucrose comes from sugarcane and has as a backup the sugar beet, which is a root vegetable. It is a kind of a beet, in fact. Um, 
the uh, other sorts of sugars are all across plants and usually mixed. So that is many things that you would say, oh, this is mostly sucrose or this is mostly fructose. They quite often have a mix of different sugars, including glucose, oh, fructose, sucrose, and possibly others. Uh, quite often in the natural world, you find things uh, tend not to be just chemically pure, especially when chemicals are similar to each other. Uh, you will find a mixture of them involved. We could, um, if you are interested in where sugar comes from, uh, I really encourage you to go look at the Wikipedia page on sugar. This is a picture of me in uh, Brazil in standing in the middle of a sugarcane field showing some freshly harvested sugarcane. And uh, if you ever get a chance, you should try tasting a little sugarcane. Uh, and it is sweet, but not super sticky sweet. It's not like you squeeze sugarcane and molasses comes right out of it. It's much more watery than that. And what they told us at the sugarcane refinery is that a thousand kilograms of sugarcane will get you 70 kilograms of refined sugar. So just think about that. And sugarcane is the best thing that we know of for turning sunlight and CO2 into sugar. So uh, the efficiency of these processes should be something you keep in mind as you are thinking about food science. There's a whole lot of stuff that isn't food that we tend to produce along with the food. Starch is here in the sugar presentation because starch turns out to be what's called a polymer of glucose. So here we have glucose again, and let's look at the word polymer. So glucose is not a polymer, but a polymer is many mers. What's a mer? Well, you can think of it as a unit. So a polymer is when we take a whole bunch of these things and stick them all together. And hopefully this is obvious here. You see how we have that same structure repeated 300 to 600 times, and that is then amylose, which is a type of straight chain starch. And you can see, sort of by looking at it, if you had a whole bunch of glucose you wanted to store, you might just link it all to each other. These little connections right here are called alpha 1,4. Go find yourself a biochemist to explain why they have that exact name. Um, and you'll notice that uh, you can actually make a polymer of glucose several different ways. So this is putting all their glucoses in a straight line. You also have the option to make the chain what they call branch which is you stick another glucose or two off uh, the carbons that are at the top. And that gives us a different molecule name. Here it is. This one is amylopectin. And between the two of these, you have pretty much all the starches you are familiar with. And the balance between the uh, two uh, changes the properties of the food and making it easier to use the starch to thicken things at different temperatures, or not. So these things are uh, chemicals that you would find in, say, corn, you find it in potatoes, and you find it in flour uh, in slightly different mixes. Now I want to tell you something super cool chemically about starch. So if you look at both of these starches, you'll see that quite a lot of their uh, bonds, uh, this one up here is a little bit different, but uh, all of these are that alpha-1,4 kind of bond I mentioned earlier. Let me show you a different chemical. This over here is another polymer of glucose. And if you look closely, you'll see it's, it's very much similar to what you've seen before, except there's something really odd going on here. Do you notice how, if you look back at our amylose, in this drawing, this part 
where there's more carbons and uh, oxygen sticking up off the ring is sticking up every single time. Whereas here, and I know uh, switching projections makes this hard to see, but there's that same group on this glucose. This one's pointing up. But then this one, the next one over, is pointing down. That's because in the middle here is not our friend the alpha 1,4 bond, but what's called the beta 1,4 bond. And that seems like a super small change, right? Like uh, if you haven't had biochemistry or um, organic chemistry, it might be really easy to not to just not notice that change had happened, right? Like it's all C's and O's and H's anyway. But what that means, that really tiny little change means is over here, we have food, we have carbs, we have bread, we have uh, the thickeners in pudding. Whereas over here with the cellulose, we have wood. Yep, or cotton, uh, or just the inedible parts of plants. Um, this you can't digest. And in fact, uh, most folks you know can't digest it. When I say folks, I mean all sorts of critters. Like, you know, your cat can't digest this. And uh, the birds can't digest this. Um, but, uh, and that's because even though this is very, very, very chemically similar. In fact, these two chemicals here might have exactly the same molecular weight. Um, what uh, is a key difference is the shape of this bond, that connection, uh, is, is a connection that we don't have enzymes that can digest. In fact, pretty much only some bacteria that live inside termites um, and cows have the enzymes that can break that down. Whereas all sorts of folks and critters have things that can break these down. So that's just really neat how such a tiny little chemical change can make such a big difference to a food. All right, last thing we got to talk about here is fiber. And fiber is any polysaccharide. So those carbohydrates that are polymers of sugars, uh, that you can't digest. So that includes cellulose, like we were talking about on the last page, and a bunch of things that are kind of like it. Again, notice that bond, this indigestible version of the bond where we have some of the OHs down and some of the OHs up. Uh, so we have cellulose, hemicellulose, and this over here, uh, xanthan gum, which I'm sure you've seen as ingredients on things as a thickener. Um, so fiber stuff that you can't digest. Uh, usually, uh, because it's a polysaccharide, usually this is coming into your diet through plants. So it's in plant-based foods. So you have a nice stalk of celery, there's some celery for you. Uh, celery, quite a lot of fiber. Um, and you can tell in part because that's what's the structure of the celery to begin with. But it's also in apples and it's in strawberries. It's all over the place. But things that are more like chewing on a piece of wood tend to be higher in fiber because guess what? Made out of the same stuff. So this is a, a popular kind of polysaccharide in food engineering because you can add it to a food product and the food product gets bigger and weighs more, uh, but it does not uh, contain, star of simplification, contain, it is, since it is not digestible, its calorie count remains relatively low because we've put uh, or there was naturally a quantity of fiber, which is not digestible. Um, another thing that's interesting uh, in this is, of course, what's digestible is in the stomach and intestinal enzymes of the beholder. So things that are fiber for you may not be fiber, may not be indigestible for 
other uh, living creatures. And this, for example, is why eating beans might give you gas. Some of the stuff that is indigestible for you is happily digestible by the microorganisms that inhabit your lower intestine.